Good morning. Good morning. Now, I will tell you, I am the president of a historically black college, and historically black colleges come from the black church tradition. The black church tradition is a call and response tradition, which means we've got to have a little bit more liveliness than that original response, OK? Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. That is so much better. You guys gave me a response like we were at a Catholic mass, all right? This is very, very different. Uh, my name is Michael Sorrell, and I'm the president at Paul Quinn College. And if you are in this session, that means that you've come to find out how Paul Quinn College is going to poverty-proof America. So let's get right to it. So in April, we celebrate the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And one of my favorite quotes from Dr. King is this one. And this is not the I have a dream quote. Right? This is the version of Dr. King who was deeply concerned about the level of poverty that existed in this country. And he said, and one day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? Why are there 40 million poor people in America? Today we would have to ask the question, why are there 41 million poor people in America? We believe at Paul Quinn College that America is at war against its future. Our graduates are unprepared. In this country, our high school, I'm sorry, our college graduates, 79% uh, of the employers that are hiring them for entry level positions wish that they came to them with real world work experience. Entry level hires want them to come, want the graduates to come to them with real world work experience. But they're not the only ones that are disappointed. 50% of college students wish that higher ed would give them real world work experience. So higher ed, we have two customers. We have the students and we have the employers and neither one of them are happy with our product. The only people that are happy at this point happen to be us because we charge people a lot of money, all right? So colleges are too expensive. 70% of today's graduates are graduating with significant student loan debt. 44 million Americans owe $1.5 trillion in student loan debt, and the average student loan debt is $37,172 at graduation. It's hard to argue that the country isn't at war with its future when these are your numbers. But the country is also at war against our students because our students are unprepared. 46% of college, I'm sorry, of the students who took the SAT in 2017 weren't ready for, were ready for college, which meant 54% of them weren't. That number is even worse when you get to our Latino and African American students. 31% of SAT takers who were Hispanic were prepared, and 20% of black test takers were considered college ready. That's not what it looks like if you are actually not at war with your future. Our students are unprepared, our graduates are unprepared, and at the end of the day, our students are poor. You can look at this map and you can see that the majority of students coming from public K through 12 educational institutions in this country live in low income families. The entire southern portion of our country, with the exception of Arizona, which is 50% students living in low income communities, the entire southern ring of our country, those students are living in poverty. Our students aren't getting a good enough education at college. They're paying too much. And they aren't prepared academically. And they can't afford the lives that they need to lead. So here's what we're looking at. The Calvary isn't coming, right? There's no magic bullet to solve our problem. The people who could afford to end poverty, the people who could afford to address these issues, the billionaires, in 2017, they made so much money that they could have ended extreme poverty seven times over, and yet poverty still exists. Now, I ask you the question, this was just one year. They were still going to be super rich if they just took the money from 2017 and ended extreme poverty. But that's not what happened. So we're at war with our future. Our college graduates aren't prepared. Our students are poor. Our high school graduates aren't prepared. 
So we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing? And who's going to fix this? We submit to you, higher education should be the ones that fix this. So this is who we are. We are Paul Quinn College, and we call ourselves the Quinnite Nation. This is one of my students. Her name is Jasmine Norman. She's from Memphis, Tennessee. She graduated salutatorian of her class. Jasmine Norman, every year we go through a, a project with a group called Dear World out of New Orleans. And the purpose of it is you write on your body a message that you want people to know about you. The message that Jasmine wanted the world to know about her is that she was a rose who grew from the concrete. Now, this does not look like a Tupac Shakur crowd, so I'm going to help you with what that means, all right? <laughs> Tupac Shakur wrote a poem that talked about being a rose that grows from the concrete. At Paul Quinn College, we understand that roses can grow from concrete. We just think that they shouldn't have to. We also understand that every rose doesn't grow on the first day of spring. But if you come to our institution, then you are coming to us for more than just to be told what your subject matter expertise should be. You are coming because you understand that, and we understand that you need a little more time and a little more attention. But here's the thing. That map that I showed you previously about how all the students, majority of the students coming out of uh, K through 12 public education are living in poverty, that means that a whole lot more of our students are going to be roses that grow out of concrete. And we better learn how to deal with that. And the way you deal with that is dealing with the fact that they are living lives of poverty. If you give them a great education, but you, you give them an A education, but you are sending them home to an F life, you have failed them. And as institutions of higher education, we can no longer be concerned with just what happens in the classroom. So here's what we've decided to do. We have one goal at Paul Quinn College to end poverty. That's it, right? That's it. And oftentimes, we get criticized because people say, well, that's not what higher ed is supposed to do. Well, maybe it should, right? Maybe we should be concerned about the needs of the day. We believe that higher educational institutions should address the needs of the day. We should wade into the communities that our students come from. We should wade into their lives. And we should address the issues that people care about. America is angry at us as an industry. We've charged too much money, and we haven't delivered what people need. We haven't spoken to the needs of the day. That ends right now with this model. That ends at Paul Quinn College. Let me tell you about how we've done that. When I arrived at Paul Quinn College, we were closer to the city garbage dump than we were a grocery store. And think about that for a moment. What does that say to you about a community that is closer to the trash in the city than it is a grocery store? It means someone didn't care very much about you. It means you have a community that didn't have a voice to do something about it. As the anchor institution in our community, we decided to do something about it. So we terminated our football program, and we turned our football field into an organic farm. And we began to tell that story for 10 years until the city decided it was tired of having that story told. It was tired of having people call up and ask them, how can this continue? And they helped us get a grocery store. So we ended a food desert at Paul Quinn College. And that's significant because we were told that our campus had no value. A bank literally said to us, your land has no value. I went to a sermon. Uh, I heard a sermon one time that a pastor said, people spend too much time worried about the symphonies they can't play. You should worry about the symphony you can play with the strings that you have. We played the string that we have. We had 147 acres of land, right? We showed them what worthless looks like. We also addressed an environmental justice issue. Right, when the city wanted to expand the garbage dump, turn it into the largest garbage dump in the Southwest, our students and our community fought back. So in less than 10 years' time, we ended a food desert. We defeated an effort to turn our community into an environmental waste hazard. Right? But that wasn't enough. We began to realize that our students needed more from us. And this is what doing more looks like. Oh, wait, OK, just pretend that that didn't happen. Oh. Thank you. All right, so we created something called reality-based education. We wanted to know what did our students need? What was just a common sense approach that we could do that would address them and prepare them for the life that we wanted them to have? And this is what it looks like. 
we created something called the urban work college model. Right? If you come to Paul Quinn College and you live on campus, everybody gets a job. Right? Because with all due respect, I know people think education ends poverty. All my very detailed, comprehensive research has shown me money ends poverty. <laughs> right? OK? So people need jobs. So we've given everyone a job. All right? People work, our students work between 10 to 15 hours a week. We don't hold classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and everyone goes to work, every single person, right? For that, we were able to reduce tuition and free fees. Now, originally, we charged about $24,000 a year, and we thought we were doing something, right? We thought, well, we're in the lower half of the national discussion about what people charge for tuition and fees. But if your students can't afford it, they can't afford it. Every year, 80 to 90% of our students are on Pell Grants. 70% right? of those students get zero expected family contributions. We were dealing with folks who just didn't have it. And I got tired of having to pretend that I was running a collection agency instead of a higher education institution. So we cut tuition and fees by $10,000. In doing so, we created a pathway for our students to be able to graduate with $10,000 of debt or maybe a little bit more if they so choose. Right, because that's what they needed. The other thing that it allowed us to do was restrict the amount of money people could borrow on the high end. Right? Because for many of our students, student loans were their first access to capital. Because the communities they came from, they couldn't borrow money because there weren't banks. And if there were banks, they weren't considered credit worthy. So they borrowed more money they needed because their families needed it. But then on the back end, they were getting jobs where you couldn't afford to meet the debt service. So, by cutting tuition and fees, first of all, we reduced the amount of money you had to borrow, and then we also reduced the amount of money you could borrow, right? Giving people a leg up and an opportunity to be ahead as they go forward. The students also get two to four years of internships and cash stipends. Because one of the things research has shown us is that internships have a very significant role as to whether or not you get a job, right? And if you come from a Pell Grant background, that means that your family's had long-term underemployment and long-term unemployment. Who was going to help you get an internship? Who could you call? You couldn't call anyone because everyone was going to work at a minimum wage job. So you need someone to stand in the gap for you. That's what this model allows us to do. So our students go to work. Then when you do all this, you get a work college transcript, right? Then we decided that everyone was beating up on the liberal arts. Maybe we need to freshen up the liberal arts, right? I mean, nobody had really touched them in a long, long time, all right? So we said, well, if we were going to change liberal arts, what would we do? And we asked people who we thought should have a vested interest in that answer, business, right? So we asked our corporate partners, because by the way, with our work college program, what really makes it unique is the students work on and off campus. By your junior year, you are spending time in corporate offices learning about the careers that you want to have, right? So we asked our corporate partners. We said, what should students know for them to thrive? They said, well, they need to be able to write well. They need to be able to speak well. They need to be able to work in teams to solve real world problems. So we thought about that. We said, well, wait a minute. Writing well is just the old liberal arts tradition of grammar. Speaking well is the liberal arts tradition of rhetoric. And working well in teams to solve real world problems sounds an awful lot like reasoning, right? So we said, well, why don't we just require every single class to teach those things, right? And so by repetition, the students become experts in those areas. So we created writing across the curriculum, speaking across the curriculum, and critical thinking across the curriculum. Every single course requires you to write papers, to get up and give public presentations, and to work in teams to solve real world problems. So the second leg of the education is subject matter expertise acquiring these skills. But then that led us to the third piece, or the fourth piece that folks told us. And they said, we need students to be comfortable in the new digital space. So we thought, maybe we should build digital mastery. So what we decided to do starting next fall is every single semester, students acquire a stackable digital credential, right? So at the end of each semester, they pick up a skill. 
The first semester, and here's the easiest example, is we're going to teach them Microsoft Office Word. I mean, Microsoft Office certification, right? Do you know you can make $70,000 a year being Microsoft Office certified? So if you stay with us one semester of college, you are out of poverty, right? You're out of poverty, you and your family. But if you stay all four years, you will graduate with an academic transcript which speaks to your subject matter mastery. You'll graduate with a work transcript which speaks to what you have learned in your work assignments. And you will graduate with four to eight stackable digital credentials which will allow you to navigate the digital space, right? We have given our students three forms of education to serve as a backstop because we understand that we want our students to be lifelong learners and everyone should do that. But if you've paid this much money for school, maybe you should leave with skills that make you a lifelong earner as well as a lifelong learner. So there's some other things that turned out to be really important about creating success in poverty-proofing education. You've got to address wraparound services. And part of the wraparound services is getting students on campus for as long as you can to stabilize them. So we created a summer bridge program. Turns out that summer bridge program is the single biggest determinant of whether or not you are successful at Paul Quinn College. Our students spend six weeks on campus. I am their first professor. The vice president of academic affairs is their second professor. And they are immersed in our culture. They pick up nine academic credit hours for the cost of the Pell Grant. So effectively, our students come to Summer Bridge for free. They pick up nine credit hours, which gives them a jump start to being on time and graduating early. We don't teach them remedial courses in Summer Bridge, by the way, because how depressing would that be? You come to college to be reminded of all the things you don't have. Right? How about we give you your first experience, a leveling up experience, and create an academic pathway that makes you successful? Second thing we did was we created a mental health culture. Our students, the trauma of poverty rests heavy on their souls and in their minds. So we just get it out of the way early. You come to Summer Bridge, every single student gets a mental health assessment, every single one. And then we, have, we hold town hall meetings twice a year where I get up and I talk about the importance of mental health. And we make it safe. If you need to go see a counselor, we have counselors on staff. You go, no one is judged. You come to our campus now and you will hear about people talking about, hey, I needed to go see the counselor and the counselor was helpful. The counselor has become an integral part of our college experience and staff and the students love it. Instead of calling it uh, business development or the career development office, we call it the office of prestigious opportunities. Because if you graduate, if you're coming from poverty, we need to talk about this as a prestigious opportunity to get out of poverty. But what inspired us to come up with that name was I got tired of reading the list of schools that produce Rhodes Scholars and all the schools are the same. So I called up one of the schools, my alma mater, Duke, and I asked them, how do you do it? How do you produce Rhodes Scholars every year? They said, oh, we have an office for that. And I was like, of course you do, right? <laughs> so now we do too, okay? <laughs> we have an office and we are preparing our students to apply for prestigious scholarships. Now we're not gonna produce a Rhodes Scholar next year, but I promise you this, within the next decade, we will start a run of producing Rhodes Scholars from Paul Quinn College. No, thank you very much. We revised the academic calendar because we thought this was important. Do you know that how expensive it is for students to go home at Thanksgiving and turn back around and go home at Christmas two weeks later? You know how depressing it is to realize you can't afford to go home for Thanksgiving? So why don't we just send everybody home at Thanksgiving? So we start school two weeks earlier in August and because of that, we can end the semester at Thanksgiving and not have people feel a pressure about their inability to go home with their families. Right? You know who loves that new schedule the most? The faculty. <laughs> All right? Like, I have become their hero with that one, okay? Uh, the other thing we do with the academic calendar is we now run school two years, I'm sorry, year round for the first two years of school, which allowed us to create a pathway for everyone to graduate in less than four years. So if you are motivated, you can graduate in three years. If you're average, you can graduate in three and a half. And if you're a little slow, you graduate on time. Right, not a bad deal. The other thing starting next fall is that we have created a travel abroad requirement. Every student must travel abroad in order to graduate. Right, now, we've done this in a way that makes it accessible. 
For the students that can afford or have the inclination to travel abroad and travel overseas, great. For those who can't, we've arranged for them to have opportunities studying with Native American tribes, which qualifies as traveling to a sovereign nation, which is just another way of solving the problem, right? And creates the opportunity for people to learn cultures in their own country much different than their own. So we're excited about that. Uh, what do we have next? So here's some of the evidence of our successes. At graduation, 74% of all our graduates are employed. If you participated in the corporate work program, 100% of those graduates are employed at graduation. Our retention rate is 71%, which I just have to tell you, when I arrived, the retention rate was 33%. The thing I forgot to tell you is that when I arrived 12 years ago, the school was a year and a half to two years from closing. They told us we were out of business. So we just blew it up and created something different. And this is what different looks like. Since 2010, and one other thing, I lost 80% of the students in my first two years of being a college president, right? I will forever be appreciative of that board for not firing me for losing their students, right? Since that time, enrollment's up 250%. So this is also evidence of our success. We opened up a second campus, PQC Plano. Uh, we opened up a campus in the growing metropolis of Plano, Texas which is home to a tremendous amount of corporate headquarters. We are beta testing a model where our students go to school in the offices of their corporate partners, right? So the big thing is we want them to have really nice apartments because they come from not nice apartments. So we spend our money making sure they have great places to live and are surrounded by amenities and the places to work where they take their courses and it's a cohort model which then allows us to reduce all the overhead that you have to charge students to go to school. So now you don't charge it, which is a way of keeping the cost of education down. So we're very excited about that. This is what's next for us, scale. We're gonna replicate this model across the globe. That is what we have come to do. We think that there needs to be a scalable version of small college experience. I think it's great that some school to two, three hundred students, two, two three hundred thousand students, or fifty thousand students on campus, but everyone doesn't learn that way, nor should they have to. Maybe there's a real value in going to school in places where people know who you are and they know whose you are, right? Like I was one of those students. I went to a small liberal arts college, had 2,800 students. I went to a small prep school, it had 1,200 students. My graduate school program had 24 students. My law school class was 200 students, with 600 students in all of it. I thrived in an environment that was smaller and more nurturing. I think everyone could use a little more nurturing in their lives. So we've decided to scale that model. So we're gonna replicate. Uh, Plano was our first stop. We have Boston Consulting Group working on our replication model. We've already identified some cities that we're looking at, and we've already identified some cities in foreign countries that are gonna be on our list as well. We think this is the future, a higher education model that addresses the needs of the students and their families today. A higher education model that does not require you to spend the rest of your life paying off college. A higher education model who sees you for where you are, meets you for where you are, and lifts you to the places that your dream should be. We think it is time for higher education to speak to the needs of the day. We cannot just be people who are happy to say artificial intelligence is gonna put 40 million people out of work and not do anything about it. We've got a solution for that too. I would tell you about it, but some of you might steal my idea. I like you, but I don't know you well enough to trust you, all right? My point is we have to be constantly innovating, right? And I don't think innovation always has to come from Harvard or from Stanford. I think there's such a thing called grassroots innovation that innovates for people who are normal everyday people who need you to get it right because their lives depend on you helping them make it incrementally better. So we are, no, thank you very much. So we are Paul Quinn College. This is what we do. This is who we are. If you would like to know more, you are welcome to come visit us or I will stand right here and answer your questions as long as you have them. But thank you for the honor of your time. Thank you for the honor of your attention. And thank you for making the choice to be here today to find out what it looks like to believe in something different than what everyone tells you you should believe in. Thank you.